So we have Matt Berninger from The National and also has a new uh, solo album out, Serpentine Poison. Serpentine Prison, Prison I'm sorry. <laughs> That's a way better name. <laughs> <laughs> Serpentine Prison, the new yeah. album from Matt Berninger, who is our guest for the first cut. And we had some questions for you, Matt. We're going to jump right in. What was the first record you fell in love with? Um, I think it was the Grease soundtrack. Um, I mean, fall in love. I think I, I think it was. Yeah, that was the first record that I think I just played over and over again and, you know, got emotionally attached to uh, all the characters and everything and all the all the songs. Uh, definitely that. I think that that record. Yeah. Are we talking about the movie soundtrack? Yeah, the mo I mean, the movie musical soundtrack, Hopelessly Devoted to You um, <laughs> and all that stuff, you know, all those songs um, on that record. Um, the one that I want, I just, I, everything in that record was so, such brilliant songs, um, both. Yeah, I mean, I think as a kid hearing that was like, um, you know, I, I didn't have a lot of records as a kid and my parents didn't have a ton and, and, and they had some, but that was like something that 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 just was, was uh whatever so special for for i guess probably my whole generation on, on some levels even adults you know that movie and everything so was it i believe it was a double album if memory serves i know there was a big fold out yeah i remember it was a, and i remember really pouring over like all the, the images and all the you know and and, and I, you know i had a, a very very uh big crush on olivia newton john <laughs> you know and frenchy i think and um <laughs> And then the one who was who Stockard Channing played, uh, I can't remember who she played. Rizzo. Was, oh, Rizzo. Rizzo. Yeah, I had a yeah. thing for Rizzo. I had a thing for all of them. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I, I saw that movie millions of times. I was obsessed with it as well. Um, what was the first song you learned on an instrument? Well, I don't play. I mean, I I, I don't play those. Um, I I'm more I'm I uh, I took piano lessons as a kid, um, but I kind of. Um, recitals and all that stuff freak me out so um i mean whatever whatever there's <laughs> whatever there's there's you know the entertainer i think was probably the first uh song i learned to play on the piano you know um and um but uh i i don't really play instruments um i'm more of a i play my my whatever musically i'm just like a, a a melody guy you know a song and words and melody guy yeah. When did you find out that you had a voice? I mean, because you have a, this beautiful, deep baritone voice, which I would imagine probably happened after puberty. But uh, uh -huh. when, did you, when did you realize that you could <laughs> sing? Did you were you part of a choir or anything like that? Well, I sang a lot in church. Well, no, actually, no, I didn't. I, I, I pretended to sing a lot in church. Um, I was one of those people that would, you know, just mouth the the, <laughs> the, the, the song. But there were some. But I did like those songs. Um, um, in fact, my favorite song was just quoted. I think it, it was was it Biden's speech, and he will raise you up in eagles' wings and bear you on the breath of dawn, uh, and something that whatever that one is eagle's wings um was just used i think in a biden speech i remember that i love that song but i didn't remember like singing that much i didn't discover i had a voice until um long after already being in a band my first band nancy um i, I just wanted to be in a band so bad and i wanted to write songs so bad and i had friends that were could play the guitar and so i just started singing in that band um not all the songs but i and, and and I slowly learned to sing by by doing it. So there was never there was never a moment at all where I thought like, oh, I've got a good singing voice. It was it was like four or five records in. I was like, oh, I've, I'm starting to sound okay now. I don't sound my speaking voice is still pre pre puberty as, as sometimes. But um, <laughs> yeah. what was the first song you wrote? Oh God! I mean, it would it would have been with Nancy that 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 band um, that I wrote that was in with college in college, and there's a bunch of songs on there. Um, I haven't listened to that record in so long. It's kind of one of those things you're afraid to you know spend too much time with your photos from high school, too many too many pimples. But um, there's a song on there called Battery Mistake. And um, and I remember thinking that I remember there was some some halfway decent writing in that and. Um, and I tried to remember what the hell, I, even what it was about. And I, and it finally dawned on me. Um, I remember that it was about, it was about a girlfriend I had in college. And I was like, what does that even title mean? I couldn't remember. And 
I broke up with her um, freshman year in college, and then the and in or the sophomore year, then I started dating somebody else who was sort of like a femme fatale type. Uh, she broke my heart, broke broke me, and then I went back to the first one, and was broken hearted from the second one and <laughs> i had my head my walkman and i went to borrow i asked and my, my walkman was out of batteries and i went and asked my ex-girlfriend if she had any batteries and <laughs> it was such a shitty thing to do right and i because i was heartbroken over the girl i dumped her for and um <laughs> And I remember how how I just felt so shitty about that, and so I wrote a song called "Battery Mistake." And, and, and uh, yeah, so I was like, "That's kind of." I remember why at least what the song was about, and I was like, "Well, that was a good thing to write a song about," you know. It's a great title. Yeah, yeah. Um, although I, I was like, when I when I was looking back at those titles, and uh, I was like, "Oh, bad!" It sounds such, like such a violent title. I was like, "What is that about?" And then I remember <laughs> it's literally about Duracell batteries. And, <laughs> you know, for my Walkman, yeah. Right, where did you go to college? Well, that happened at Miami University of Ohio. I went there, it was a, you know, liberal arts school and I went there for two years. Um, and I studied first pre-med and then I switched to sculpture. And then I, then I transferred to University of Cincinnati for their design art and architecture program. Um, and and, and uh, the, that DAP program. And so I went to college there for five years. So I just start all over. So I, I went to college in and around Southern Ohio for, for seven years, you know, and um, yeah, I loved college. I loved all parts of it, all the different types of experiences. I loved it, yeah. Did you, are you an architect? No, I was a designer though for for ten years in New York City before the National really before I quit doing that and because the National was doing well enough that I could. Um, so was Scott Devendorf in the National. We both um, and, and everybody in that first band. We all met in design school at UC and and um, yeah. And, and so design. Um, I mean, design and architecture and, and urban planning and fashion design. Those were all the the people. Almost all of my friends from college all married fashion designers um, and moved to New York, and and so um, that whole world um, is very much sort of my uh, my world. Yeah, like like I mean, it's much sort of that sort of design art. And in New York, I was a creative director at a company for 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 you know a long time, and during the internet boom and stuff. And so I was a you know I was a professional man for a while. Yeah. Wow. I had no idea about your yeah, backstory. It was that. awful. No. <laughs> um, what was the first heartache song you really connected with? I mean, I I, I think about that a lot. Um, 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 at least, I, like, what was it that, because I was asking what made me want to, somebody asked, like, what was the song that made me want to write songs? And and and, um, and I keep going back to Roberta Flack's Killing Me Softly. Um my parents, like I like, didn't have a ton of records, but they had a handful, um, and that was one of them. And that just was played constantly. And I and I think that song, "Killing Me Softly," or um, there's another song on there called "Jesse," um, th that's just so devastating about you know Jesse come home and and uh, you know or the first time I, I ever ever I saw your face. There's the, those I remember listening to that record and and hearing this level of emotional desperation that I'd never heard in anything else, you know, at, at, up to that point, you know, it's like as a kid hearing, you know, killing me softly with your song. Um, so, you know, it, it, yeah, that had, that had a profound, I think, effect on, I, I wanted to, I wanted to kill someone softly with my song, you know, <laughs> I want, whatever, whatever that person did to make Roberta Flack fall in love with them, you know, and then she wrote a song about them, their song. I wanted that. I wanted yeah. to be that guy. And, and yeah. I remember, yeah. So, so I think, I think that whole record. Um, Do you know that song was written by somebody else? It wasn't Killing Me right. Softly? Right. Yes. It was written by some young woman who saw Don McLean in concert at a yeah. club. And she. Is that who she, she wrote it about? Don McLean? Yes. Yes. She wrote that about Don McLean. I didn't know that. I, I never I knew the backstory. <laughs> and I think, I, I think, yeah, I think that really attests to the power of that song and the way mm -hmm. Roberta Flack delivers it. Um, because this woman, I think, recorded it, but it just didn't go anywhere for her. 
it, but, it, it, but Roberta Flack, of course, took it to a whole other level, you know? It, it, is, a, it is a thing, a, a, a beautifully written song and, and, and structurally and everything that like, it, it, it can, it can, there's, there's things like, like, you know, Dolly Parton's, um, um, I will always loved you, love you, you know, yes. and then Whitney Houston's version of it, you right. know, both of them, both of them, you know, or nothing compares to you by Prince and verse. And then there's Sinead O'Connor's, which is unbelievable. They're both unbelievable. You know, it's, it's the testament to like, what incredible songs, you know, that, um, some people don't even like you don't even realize like that wasn't even written by that person who who performed it sometimes and and it it still it still becomes entirely theirs you know yes um, you yeah. recently covered stardust i covered i've covered a bunch of stuff a bunch of stuff with booker i covered stardust he had me cover stardust the song on the song stardust on his record which was written by hoagie carmichael I think, but I fell in love with the Willie Nelson version, which yes. Booker produced, and that's kind of why I became friends with Booker over long, like a long time ago. And so, wait, yeah, wait, Booker, Booker T. Jones, he produced the Stardust album of yeah, Early he enough. produced and arranged Stardust. Yeah. Oh my gosh, I didn't realize that. No, wow. Yeah, no. I didn't that's actually a realize that. That's I didn't realize that until a few years ago, long after I had met Booker. And it's kind of the reason I reached out to Booker T to make Serpentine Prison with me because I wanted that personality that Stardust has. Um, and I started doing a ton of covers of Booker, a bunch of Velvet Underground covers and covers by Morphine and and a, a bunch of different people. Um, and that's how the record, that's how the project started. And then it turned into these originals, but... Um, yeah, covering other people's songs is a really good way to learn how to write songs. <laughs> yeah. What's the most recent song you've learned? That I mean, it could be an original well, um, of your own, or, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, the, we did, the, the most recent one I think is probably Waiting for the Man by, by Velvet Underground. Um, I did a couple of Velvet Underground covers with Booker and, and um, Waiting for the Man. Well, European Sun was another Velvet Underground song that was like really interesting to, um, because it's almost like just a c c cacophonous, uh, dissonant vamp the whole thing, right? And 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 it's uh, it's 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 very you know uh, you know deconstructed song vamp you know vibe, and it was so there wasn't a lot to uh, there wasn't a lot to, to to do wrong. I mean, it's 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 other than just you know try to be too faithful to to it. So because it'd be just like, we'd be copy, copying dissonance. It'd be like, you know, trying to paint, a, a, like copy a Jackson Pollock painting, you know, it's just going to look stupid. Mm -hmm. um, don't never, don't ever do it. Mm -hmm. you know? So, so we kind of did our own sort of painting. We like Booker, we all just, we, it, you know, just set it in, in, in the, in the key and set it in generally the zone. And I had the lyrics and the lyrics are just the same thing kind of over and over again. Um, that was really fun to sort of realize some songs I like, do not want you to to be faithful to them others like you have to get it right or else it's going to fall apart you know it's like there sometimes songs are souffles other times they are scrambled eggs you know you can't mess it up you know it's like it's really hard it's it's it's, it's a strange thing it, but but um yeah so those are two that i've done recently yeah what um who was the first artist that you really idolized um I mean that's an awkward question because it's probably Morrissey, mm. you know, and and I and and you know and and Morrissey from the Smiths is is some and the right in that band the Smiths I think was the first band that made me think of music as literature, you know, more than just entertainment or rock and roll is more than that, you know, uh, and now I don't I don't really align myself with any of like Morrissey's sort of thoughts and in, and in, in, in places he is in terms of the way he thinks of the world and many, and so that's kind of, that's an awkward thing. Um, and, um, but yet I still idolize that music. I still do totally idolize, you know, the queen is dead and all that stuff. And, and so, um, then, you know, but then people like, people like Tom Waits, Leonard Cohen, Nick Cave, Nick Cave is probably, He's probably the one, you know. He's the he's he's the one that that I just I you know I've had opportunities to meet him and stuff, and I just I don't can't do it, you know. Keep people. Some people need to stay magic, you know. <laughs> so you never did meet him then. You didn't meet Nick Cave. You just yeah. No. Huh. 
I met Leonard Cohen once, just super briefly, um, wow. very briefly. Like, Did you ever get to see Leonard Cohen perform live? I can't say I met Leonard Cohen. I passed him, and we and he said hello, and we like tipped hats to each other, and that, it felt like I met him. I, I never met Leonard Cohen. That's what happened <laughs> with me. It was between tents in the mud, and it feels really important to me. Um, <laughs> but um, what, what was your sorry? That's okay. Did you ever get to see Leonard Cohen perform live? Yeah, yeah, um, and and this was this was when you know and maybe, yeah, I guess it was the only time I actually saw him live, and it was in Brazil. <laughs> was it in Portugal? Was it in no? It was in Spain. Um, <laughs> I can't remember. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. I remember, and but I do remember um, Scott Devendorf and I were there, and it was um, it was when he had to go back on tour because of his manager had kind of taken all his money and he had to go tour again and he had never really planned to, but he lost like $2 million to his manager, whom he still loves very much apparently, or is very fond of, or so he says, but that was the tour and he was just incredible. And it was, you know, to watch Leonard Cohen sing those songs into to a crowd of like, you know, I don't know, 60 to 100, 60 to 80,000 people. And, watch that many people just being welling up and just being kind of, you know, in a spirit, very spiritual place communally. Um, yes. Because of how his music has meant so much. And, you know, people were bringing, when you go to a show like that, uh, you, you bring people are bringing their whole lives to that show and 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 because that people like Leonard Cohen's music has affected their lives and played a played an important role in their lives and then they everyone comes there and just spills themselves, you know. It's so, yeah, Scott and I wept <laughs> shoulder to shoulder um, with everyone else. Um, I think it was in Spain. <laughs> He's amazing, or was amazing, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, you mentioned the uh, band Nancy. The, that was yeah. your first band? That was my first band, Nancy, um, that started was, at University of Cincinnati, yeah. Who was that named after? Or was it that was named, named after, after my mom, um, which is weird. I don't know why the band let me name it after my mom, because I was the only guy who couldn't play any instruments. <laughs> <laughs> and um scott devendorf was in that band and my friend mike brewer and, and my friend casey reese was in that band and um and i write a lot of new st stuff with 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 uh mike brewer still and, and mike brewer has has some of the i wrote some of the songs on serpentine prison with mike brewer from that first band and scott so um yeah serpentine prison is a little bit of a reunion of of some nancy members that was my mom's name too ah well, that's yeah. That would, Part why I uh, <laughs> love to your mom. Thank you. Um, what record are you listening to now that you're really loving? Um, Julian Baker's new record, which isn't out yet, but I um, I've been privileged to to hear it, uh, and it's beautiful. It's incredible. It's she. I think she's one of those um, people who are um, writing. Um, very directly, very close to the bone, very courageously, very passionately, and and uh, yeah, she's one of the most exciting writers, and 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 I've been a big fan of hers for 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 a long time, and her new record is just a just a monster. It's so beautiful. Yeah. Did you all ever collaborate, you and Julian Baker? Yeah. I thought yeah. So. Well. I Julian and um, toured with the National and opened with it for the National for a long time. That's how we kind of, for I don't know, you know, one of the tours or, or, or some shows, and and that's how we got to know each other. And then um, I wrote a song with a friend of mine named Steph Altman for Planned Parenthood of America, um, and Julian um, performed it and sang it with us. It, um, it's called All I Want, and it's on a compilation called Seven Inches uh, for Planned Parenthood. Right. Um, what's a heartache song you would go to now? Um, I I have been um, there's a I've been I have a playlist of um, of songs from all over the place and it, and it keeps generating new songs you know based on songs I already like and 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 it really works yeah I, I'm, I'm sometimes feel bad that Spotify's Spotify's algorithm. I gave it enough information and it's really, it's got my number. And yeah. so, um, yeah, so um, I would say um, there's, there's Julia Jacqueline, um, um, her record Crushing um, is, has blown me away. Um, and then um, I also, Joan Shelley, 
is a writer that's just kind of blowing me away. Um, um, She's from Louisville, by the way. So we know we know Joan really well. Oh, Joan, I didn't know she was from Louisville. Yeah, yeah. That's so cool. Um, yeah. Tell her hello. Yeah, I'm a big fan. I've never met her and I've never crossed paths with her at all, but I'm, yeah, I'm a big fan. Um, I love her. She's great. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I've been finding out even, even stuff that there's a, a Rodney Crowell song that is a duet with Roseanne Cash that I'd never heard before. It's called It Ain't Over Yet. Um, and I keep playing that one. I just keep going back to that. It's just, it's just, it's just one of the songs that is just like fitting, fitting every, you know, pressing every button for me right now. And, and um, that was, by, that's by Rodney Crowell. Um, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm, I think there's so many good things being written now. And then I'm, I'm also simultaneously discovering songs I had never heard like classics that I just didn't know that much about, you know? Um, I'm starting like to really listen to a lot of Scott Walker and like Arthur Russell a little more and, and, and just people that, that, uh, we're not, we're not big marquee people, but, but influence so many of the people that I love, like Scott Walker, who from Cincinnati or from Ohio, hmm. who he was one of the biggest influences on David Bowie, you know, and, and, uh, he was one of David Bowie's favorite artists of all time. And, um, and he's just such an idiot. He's just a, such a singular type of a artist whose career just evolved and and changed and and developed. And he was always jumping off of artistic ledges, you know. Um, and I think that's why he inspired Bowie so much. Um, but yeah, and so I'm just now really kind of like getting getting back to like sort of learning a lot about his catalog and and him as an artist. And he's he's from my neighborhood, you know, <laughs> sort of, you know, oh. and and. He ended up influencing the, like Bowie, who in, influenced me more than more than the guy who lived up the street. You know, it's weird. It's, it's, weird. it's weird. I love it. Yeah. I'll have to look into him. I don't know anything about Scott Walker. Scott Walker yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh well. He also big, huge influence on Radiohead. Yeah, a guy from Ohio. Yeah. Wow, I had no idea. Um, I could have what? all my facts wrong, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, oh, we'll no. we'll put in that disclaimer. <laughs> yeah, look um, all that stuff up. Look everything. <laughs> What's a song that that really lifts you up? That you would go to if feeling down. Um. Um. God. Um. It would be like a complete mood changer. Like, is there a song that? If you put on, it would just change your whole. Theme. Maybe like the Supremes um, up on the roof. What's the name of this? <laughs> just, that is it, up on the roof. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 there's, there's, there's just something so simple about that, where it's just like, just go get a different perspective. You know, just, just change your perspective, uh, and you'll be a little closer to heaven. It's like such a simple thing. Go up, but it's also literal. It's like go up to the roof, you know, and you're a little closer to heaven. And also you can just see the world a little bit differently. You just change your, change your, your, just look at it differently. Um, uh, that one always puts me in a good mood. Um, yeah. It's so funny. It's like most songs, it's often mo mostly like the sad songs, like, like really sad songs actually change, put me in a good mood because it allows, it allows you to sort of like, it's a vent. It allows you to vent some of your own sadness or find empathy in someone else's, you know how they manage to make something beautiful out of their pain yeah and really helps you with your own stuff right and so happy songs don't really make me happy sad songs make me happy mm, okay cathartic cathartic mm. in that way well um matt we're gonna we're gonna let you go but i do i am curious as to how you're doing during the pandemic and just how you're coping in terms of i don't know like what are you is it making you more creative being somewhat isolated or i like being home um I, I i like not having to uh travel so much and tour and, and, and i miss shows um but and, and i and i honestly i swing i swing wildly a little bit between um um creative bursts of excitement and optimism and 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 finding finding comfort and pleasure in in in, in art and all that <laughs> stuff um and then you know, and then 
total <laughs> paralysis and 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 catatonic um existential dread um you know and back and forth <laughs> you know, I, think, <laughs> I think it's i'm on a he healthy mixture of uh, optimism and and dread and and you know and just just trying to stay busy and trying to stay healthy really it's like it's it's a sometimes it's as simple as that yes absolutely well we wish you all the best and uh and thank you so much for spending your time with us it's, it's awesome to talk with you thanks so much a pleasure hopefully i'll see you in the old neck of the woods soon i hope so take care thanks bye-bye <laughs>